<laughs> this is Les Bakke. You know who you are, but uh, maybe not everyone does. <clears throat> so Les is a amateur genealogist with nearly 40 years experience as his family's record keeper, uh, dating back to the early 1980s. He has traced his Norwegian family tree back to the uh, early 11th century. He's a great friend of the library in this community, and we are happy to have him here. Uh, so go ahead, take it away, Les. All right, I'm going to put the screen share on so that we can see what we're talking about. And everybody should be able to see the introduction to genealogy screen. Somebody nod. Yes, Thank we you. can see here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've done this uh, little class several times in the past, and and I use personal data, mostly personal data on the uh, presentation because I don't think it's fair to use anybody else's. So you're gonna see a lot of my family on here, not because I'm, I'm overly special or anything else, but uh, on the screen that you're seeing before you, you can see uh, my picture in the middle in my Air Force uniform, my parents, my father, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about him later his parents, my mother, and her parents. All four of the grandparents were immigrants to this country. Uh, and that gets a little interesting. I'm gonna talk about that later on as well. Now, how are you gonna start finding out about your family? Well, the easiest way and the best way is to start asking yourself questions because you know who you are. You probably know who your parents were. You may know who your grandparents were. You may have stories from your family and, and start writing them down. And then go to your family members, your brothers, sisters, if your parents are still around, if grandparents are still around, they're wonderful resources. So ask them questions. And I found oh, a few years ago that asking neighbors of your family or where you grew up you find more interesting things. Matter of fact, the neighbors sometimes know a lot of things that your parents won't even tell you about. So they're good to talk to and, and find out information from. Uh, if you're going back to your earlier days, uh, talk to uh, high school classmates, elementary classmates, college classmates, and ask them what they remember about you and some of the stories from back then. Just remember that people like to read about stories. They're not so interested in saying on the 27th of October, this, this, this person was born and they came on a ship in the middle of May and that kind of things. But they're much more interested in the stories. So if you can get stories from these people, it enhances your family history for others. And don't forget the bottom of that next that slide right there, make sure you record the answers to all your questions. Then you can go out and do some research. Uh, high school yearbooks, and you see a photo uh, on the right hand side of the screen where this guy uh, in a football uniform uh, was elected most athletic of his high school class. Now, there were only 37 people in the high school class, so is that a significant thing? I don't know, but it's a kind of a cool picture. That is me by any way, by, uh, by the way, in case you didn't recognize the face. Uh, family Bibles are uh, occasionally, usually a very good source because uh, people put stories in their Bibles. In particular, they have dates uh, when children are born, uh, things of that nature. If anybody in your family kept a diary long ago, uh, or even most recent, they're great uh, resource tools that you can use. Go through the diaries, pick out the stories that, that are really um, interesting and other people would like to know about. Just remember that if you publish any of this information, make sure not to publish embarrassing uh, stories from anybody. Uh, of course, newspapers are a great resource for, uh, for finding out about your ancestors. Many of the uh, newspapers are now online. Uh, they've been digitized. 
They're easily searchable, and I'm going to tell you a couple places where you can uh, go with a subscription and find out information. Now, throughout this presentation, uh, a lot of the resources that I'm telling you about are free to use. Some of them are for a cost for a subscription fee, and if they are, I'll make sure to tell you uh, what they are. Okay. In, in recent years, you know, the last 30, 40 years, uh, counties and cities are celebrating their centennial, 100 years old, 125 years old, 150 years old. And frequently they collect stories from some of the residents and in their community and publish those in the centennial books. That's another great resource. Now, you notice that little thing on the bottom, record your findings. I'm gonna talk about how to record them in a little while. What, uh, here's an example from a newspaper obituary. Happened to be from my grandmother, Mrs. Gass came to this country. America secured another inhabitant who was most worthy to enjoy the, benef the blessings of liberty. She was an energetic, energetic toiler and worked hard to educate and instruct her children so they could be good and useful men and women. Uh, I, I don't think that's what we see in obituaries today, but um, when she passed away, that's what it was. When her husband passed away, it was a similar one in the uh, newspaper, and I'm just taking part of it. Consistent life, what the heck that means, I don't know. Consistent life, esteemed and respected by all who knew it. Large attendance at funeral and procession attest to the high esteem which he was held. Okay, uh, if they write that about your grandparents, great-grandparents, you should be proud of it because those are, are nice words. Okay, I told you where to find some newspaper archives and here are a couple places you can go. There's one called newspapers.com, and the other one is newspaperarchive.com. They both cost money, uh, uh, $19.90 a month for one of them. The other one costs a nickel more, but if you buy the uh, <clears throat> six-month subscription, you see that it costs you, what, 95 cents less. <laughs> they must look at each other's... Uh, charges and, and be very competitive. If you're able to, and I'm guessing everybody in attendance today is able to, uh, do some traveling, make visits. If you go back to uh, Ancestors County Museum, if they have a museum, sometimes they have a county historical society, uh, great places to visit, you'll find interesting things, so many unexpected things. Uh, State Historical Society. There's one in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you uh, want to go down there, a great resource, and they have all sorts of stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to show you part of a of a book that they actually digitized for me for a fee, of course, and sent me the uh, digitized copy of it. If you go back to county uh, house courthouse records in your home county or county of interest, you will find things and I'll show you a little bit about that. <clears throat> and of course, most everybody knows that <clears throat> cemeteries are, are a good place to get information because they have um, name of the individual. Um, most often they have both birth date and death date and they may have other information. And nearby tombstones would have family members. So that's also a good place to go. And public libraries, of course, are a great location. You have a super library in Moorhead, Minnesota, the Laurel uh, Library System, and they have resources for you. And again, make sure you record your findings. Here's an example of what I found in the Argyle, Minnesota Historical Museum, which is in Marshall County in Minnesota. And uh, that was my home county. I grew up in New Folden, Minnesota, a long, long, long time ago. Anyhow, in the Argyle Museum, on the left-hand side, you see an old cash register and you'll see what is a butcher block table 
that is where they cut the meat. And you can see the indentation from the years of use in the right-hand side. And it was from the gas uh, butcher shop in Argyle, Minnesota. On the right-hand side is the gas orchestra. That's my mother's family in, uh, in the city hall. And I believe the city hall was in Warren, Minnesota, the county seat. And it lists some of the people that were in there. Do I have any recordings of the music of them playing? No, I've really searched long and hard for it, but I have not been able to find any. <clears throat> also from the Marshall County Courthouse, uh, the World War I records, um, many of the courthouses in Minnesota and maybe true in other states, uh, had uh, a short interview of everyone who came back from the war. And Adolf Bakke, my father, was, served in the U.S. Army during the First World War. That makes him really old, but makes me pretty old too, huh? Anyhow, from New Folden, and you see the information, he was in the uh, Minnesota uh, Artillery Park. He was in the artillery, he served in both France and, and Belgium during World War I. And I told you that the Minnesota Historical Society digitized a book for me. It was the history of the Army Artillery Park that my father was in with the First Army. Um, and AEF was the American Expeditionary Force, which is what the uh, troops that were sent over to Europe to fight in World War I were known as. And this was taken from France. And you can see the, the photo of the truck the person was driving. Anyhow, back on the um, index, you see Baki A, Adolf was his name, and he's listed in that booklet. And it shows his hometown of New Folden, Minnesota, which is incorrect. It's the one word, New Folden, Minnesota, but that's where it was from. Interesting things from the Minnesota Historical Society. You've all heard of um, Ellis Island, but there was a place prior to Ellis Island where immigrants from Europe mainly came to the United States and it was called Castle Garden. It was operational in New York from 1820 to 1892. And um, that was the first immigration center of the United States. And it has a free database out there. You can go out to castlegarden.org and do searching there and you will find information. I will show you a little bit of what I found in a couple more slides. Following Castle Garden, we had Ellis Island, which nearly every one of you have probably heard of before. Again, it's online. They have digitized nearly all of their records. They were in operation from 1862 following uh, Castle Garden up to 1954 as the primary uh, immigration site for people coming to the United States. Now, did everyone who came to the United States go through New York? No, no. Some went through Boston. Some in come through New Orleans down south. And there were many families that even came through Canada. They came through Canada and, and came across country and, and down into the States from there. But it's worth going out to uh, Castle Garden or Ellis Island to do search for your relatives because you're going to find interesting things. The next slide will show you. There's the passenger list from the Castle Garden list, and it's, and it's somewhat difficult to re read, but you see line uh, 23, that's Gast, G-A-S-T, August Gast, who was my great-grandfather. He came over with his wife, Albertina, and several children. Now, <clears throat> that was somewhat unusual back then that a whole family would uh, leave Europe and come to the United States. But that's what he did. Now, if you don't like reading the script, it also has a passion list translated, and you can get that information. August gas, arrival date on the 3rd of August, 1887. 
Uh, he was about 44 years of age, born in 1843, male, ethnicity, ethnicity, which that's a hard word for me. I'm sorry. German, place of origin, Germany, port of departure, Liverpool, England, and the ship was the uh, Wisconsin. And I did go out online and I did find an image of the Wisconsin that was used back in that time to transport passengers from um, Europe to the United States. Now, there is an interesting thing. The ethnicity, just remember that it says German. So when I was growing up, uh, all of us figured we were half Norwegian and half German. And when I get to showing you my DNA, uh, you will see something slightly different. <clears throat> Sometimes in doing in genealogy. Let's, before we move on, I, I do have a question if you don't mind. Oh. Yeah, a gentleman wants to know, how do you see the passenger list? Like, how do you access it? Oh, okay, on either uh, the Castle Garden site and or the uh, Ellis Island one, both if you places. go to the website, both of them, uh, if they have a passenger list, if there is one that they've maintained and digitized, you can read it. It's, it's really easy. Just give it a try. You know, the other thing you could do Eesh. I don't know why I'm even saying this. Uh, you could collect questions, send them to me, and I could do uh, some kind of an answer if you're interested in doing that as a library service. I'm willing to do that. <clears throat> Sometimes when you're doing your family research, you get lucky. As I did about 15 years ago, I got an email from uh, a distant cousin of mine living just outside of Oslo, Norway. And he said, you know, I hear you've been doing uh, some research into our family. Well, so have I, I've done research here. Would you like to share? And this was all uh, through ancestry.com. So it was online and we shared. I gave him about 3,500 records of people. He gave me about 3,000. So overnight my my database went from uh, from 3,500 to what 6,500. But the more interesting thing that I thought was he was doing his research in Norway in the Norwegian records of which they are very well maintained, and he pointed out these people. And from the top, he has my 18th great grandfather parents. 19th, 20th, and then on the bottom, Inga Bjardsson, who was born in 18, or 1185, and look at his occupation from Norway. His occupation was King of Norway from uh, a couple dates and uh, so forth. He ruled as king for part of Norway. He wasn't a king of all of Norway. And you got to remember back in Norway, you became a king because you were bigger, badder, meaner, and uh, more difficult or dirty fighter than your neighbor. And if your son couldn't hold it, and it was mainly a father-son thing, if your son couldn't hold the territory, well, somebody else became king. This family was a one-term king, all right? He, when he died, his son was not able to carry it on. So do we have royalty in our blood? I would say no. And there is an interesting story about the Birkebeiner skiers. Back in the time of King Inga, the, uh, there was a, a, a small civil war going on between two uh, factions in Norway. And in one faction, the uh, king of that area had been killed and his uh, four or five year old son was the only survivor. And the uh, re revolution people wanted to take care of him and kill him too. So these two skiers supposedly uh, took the boy middle of winter, went up over the mountain in Norway, came down the other side, and the young lad was raised by my 22nd great-grandfather. 
Also from um, county records, uh, you can find citizenship papers. This is a citizenship paper for my grandfather, August Gast, and it tells you the date. He was born in Germany, it says there, and he came to New York in July of uh, 80, 1887. And those are the uh, informations about him. He swore his allegiance to the United States and renounced the uh, allegiance to the emperor of Germany, who was uh, in charge of Germany at that particular time. You can also find homestead paper uh, records online. And this is about a, a homestead. And I know it's very difficult to read out there, and I apologize, but uh, you can get the idea. The homestead was, uh, was recorded in a particular date and year. In the Homestead Act of 1862, I believe it was, Abraham Lincoln signed into law, was a great uh, act for the expansion of the United States to the West from the East Coast. And that includes Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin. Um, the railroad would be given tracts of land if they planted a railroad or uh, created, constructed a railroad and they could um, service these people. And the railroads actually did recruiting over in Europe for people to come to the United States for free land. <clears throat> okay, I talked about how you, or that you must record your findings when you go out and do this sort of stuff. Some, some of us, and I include myself in it, say, oh, I'll remember that. I'll remember where I got it in the story and all. Oh, yeah, I can remember all that. Uh, doesn't work that way. You can do paper copies. Um, I know at the at the library there, you can you you can pay, I believe, a, a small sum to get uh, photocopies made. Uh, if you have something that can make digital copies of what you're doing, you should do that. Uh, you can take photos of. Uh, of material with your smartphone. You can have a laptop, a portable scanner. Uh, my sweetie Bev and I went to uh, Devil's Lake, North Dakota uh, a few years ago to their uh, county museum. And I took my laptop and my portable scanner with, and we got lots of records from her family from the Devil's Lake, North Dakota area. Optical character recognition software. That's a fancy way of saying uh, a program that will convert uh, typed material to uh, something that's edible and readable. And you can put it in a program such as Microsoft Word. Make sure that you back up your findings uh, wherever you decide to store it. If it's paper, make an extra copy. If it's digital, make a backup on a little memory stick, uh, some other device like that. And then the important thing is to store your backups somewhere else. If, uh, you know, you've heard about the tornadoes that hit the central part of the United States lately. If your stuff gets destroyed by a tornado, it's gone forever. So you can put digital copies. Digital is the easiest, of course, because then you can put it on, uh, on the cloud somewhere. If you make paper copies, make sure to give it to a brother, sister, uncle, aunt, nephew, niece, whatever, so they can keep the copies for you. All right, we're going to some online sites now. And these are free. The National Archives uh, in Washington, D.C has really, really great research uh, materials. You won't find your family out there, but you will find out uh, how to search. It will find, you will find uh, copies of some kinds of forms that you might need, and it's a great place to go. There's this place called Find a Grave and the US Gen Web Project, uh, both of them are, are very similar to one another. They go out and 
It's an all volunteer operation and they get information from uh, cemeteries. I have found that US GenWeb project is more popular on the Eastern part of the United States, whereas Find a Grave is more popular in the Midwest. And uh, you can go out there and just go to www.findagrave.com, do some searching. It's, it's helpful if you know the, at least the county of the ancestry you're looking for and makes it a lot easier to find. And what is out there, what is there are, uh, in many cases, photographs of the tombstone uh, in the cemetery, so you can read it right off the tombstone. And the two of them are worth using. If you can't find anything of a particular cemetery in one of them, try the other one. There are some special interest sites that, that I've found in my wanderings through uh, family history research. There's an atlas of historical county borders that you can go out and find because counties, uh, county borders in the development of the United States did change. Um, back in, in uh, 1849, yeah, Minnesota Territory was created and it included uh, all of North Dakota to the Missouri River. When in 1858, uh, uh, Minnesota was six, uh, admitted to the Union, the boundary changed from the Missouri River to the Red River of the North. And you can find out these inf this information at the Atlas of Historical County Borders. Interesting place. Civil War Soldiers and Sailors Database. If you have anybody in your family that uh, fought during the Civil War, it's another place to go out and look for information. Military service records uh, from the archives of the United States. This is a repository that is located in St. Louis, Missouri, and they have many of the records of service members uh, going back as far as they have paper copies. They've digitized most of them and you can go out and search for them. The, that's a good thing. The bad thing is about 40 years ago, they had a large fire in the repository in St. Louis and many of the records were destroyed, burned in the fire. Now, does this thing work? Yes, it does, because my sweetie Bev wanted to know about her father who served during World War II. So we went to this website put in the information and we got information on his, uh, his discharge, his separation from the army during World War One or World War II, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Another place that's free is the LDS Church Library and website. Uh, it is run by the Mormon Church, LDS Latter, uh, Latter-day Saints. Uh, church. I, I have run into some people that don't want their information on the Mormon church database. I don't know why. It's historical. It's, it's not anything secretive, but they don't. Unless you have one of those reservations, this is an excellent place to go out and search. And they've gotten so much better over the last 10 years. They've digitized, they used to have all microfilm, microfiche records in St. Louis. You could go to a local library of the LDS church and there's one in Fargo and request uh, a microfilm, microfiche to be sent there. And you could look through it for, I think it was two weeks before it had to be sent back. They've digitized all of those. Now you can go out and search for those online by going to familysearch.org. Anywhere you want that you have access to the web, you can do that. They also have a mobile app for your, uh, your cell phone or your tablet in both Apple and Android. You can download that and use it. As I said, there is an LDS church in Fargo and you can check the locations and hours. They have a library there. If you call or contact them, make sure you tell them you want to come over and do family research because not everyone in the library is uh, a family researcher. Just give them a little warning ahead of time so they can be prepared for you. 
<clears throat> this is another free uh, site called genie.com. And you, oh, oh, I should say the LDS search will require you to create a user ID and password. All of them will require that, as does genie.com. I did put a few things out there in my family just to test it out. And that is the home screen from the genie.com uh, website. Ancestry.com, of course, is, is the biggie. You see advertisements that for them on TV all the time. The, uh, it is by subscription only, which means you have to pay for it. Go to Ancestry.com, create a login uh, on Family Search and Ancestry. You can store your family tree online. You have lots of options regarding uh, security for your uh, online site. You can make it completely private. You can share with only people that you say you can share it with, or you can make it public. Now, there are people that don't wanna make their public, their family tree public, but they wanna look at other people's family tree. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you want them to share, why don't you share? but still your choice. You decide how much you want to make. They also, Ancestry has a mobile app and a Android app or a mobile app for Apple and Android both. You can search it anywhere you have access to the web. <clears throat> Myheritage.com is, uh, is a site located in Israel. And it, in my last checking of about three months ago, had the largest number of records of any of the databases out there for family history. Again, it's by subscription only. And some of you are probably asking, well, how come he doesn't tell me how much the subscription price is? I should have said that when I was on Ancestry. Ancestry has a, a couple different subscription options. You can do a short term a month by month, by six months, by year. Um, it's around $250 per year, unless you want the international version, then you got to kick in another 60 or $70. So it gets to be a little expensive, 300 and some dollars for a subscription. My heritage is in a similar price range. Again, you got to create an, you have to create an, a login there. You can start your family tree online, accessible anywhere on the web, has mobile app for Android and Apple. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk next about some software that you can put on your own computer. You know, this software is not available for tablets. It is software that you put on your computer and your family records, if you choose, will only be on your computer. Nobody else can see them. It allows you to maintain on your local computer. The second, second bullet there. If you have a subscription with either Ancestry.com and or Family Search, a login there, you can connect Family Tree Maker to those two sites. And the marvelous thing about this, this uh, whole thing is if you put it out there, in the background, the computers go out and search your tree and everybody else's tree. And if it finds connections, it gives you what they call hints. In, in Family Tree Maker, it looks like a little green leaf. It's called a hint. And if you click on it, it says that uh, the uh, Anderson family tree, da 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 da, has someone that appears to be the same person as it's in your tree and you click on it and if they shared it, if they share the information, you can get the information and put it in your tree. The other, the nice thing about it, getting a software on a, on, a, on a tablet, on a laptop is you don't need internet access to work on it. You just open the family tree software. Ancestral Quest is a similar software. This is from the LDS Church. Uh, it is free uh, and it's both for Mac and Windows. It allows to maintain, maintain your tree on your, 
on your uh, local computer. It finds hints again from both Ancestry and Family Search. It does not find these hints from My Heritage. If you go to find My Heritage, they have also a free software that you can download, and I believe this one is is quite a bit better than the uh, LDS software. You can download it. You do not need a subscription to, to MyHeritage to download the software. Software runs on Mac and Windows. And again, it allows you to maintain your tree on your local computer. And if you don't have a subscription to MyHeritage, of course, you can't get the hints, but it will also connect with Family Search. Now you notice both Ancestry and MyHeritage connect to their own website, plus they connect to Family Search. And this has been a change over the last 10, 12 years, also when Family Search became much more open before you had to have certain access in order to get there. All right. Both my sweetie and I have had our DNA uh, testing done. And I got this message, and this is one of the few times that I, I put a name out there that I did not have explicit permission to do that. But I got this uh, message from a DNA connection, I believe it was through Ancestry, uh, she told me her name and she had two brothers who were born in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, which is not far from New Folden, about 17 miles. They moved to California in 1956 and she wanted to know if, if I knew anything about them. She thought her brother's name were Alfred and Andy, but forgot the name that started with an A. Uh, so what I did is I knew who she was talking about. They, the family lived in New Folden and I knew who they were. So I sent her a bunch of information and you see the response, hi Les, thank you. It brings tears of joy to hear from you, da, 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 da. And she goes on and talks about her relatives that were related to the Baki family, which is my family. They're in California now. And uh, she got some of the information she wanted and that's what it was. I am not an expert on DNA. I'm going to take a quick look at chat because we've got nine things out there. All right, I'm going to hold the questions until the end. Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, DNA testing, and uh, you can see there, there are several different types of DNA testing. Um, if you want some real advice on that, uh, there's a guy named Michael, and I forget his last name. He works for the University of North Dakota in their genealogy room at the library, and he is excellent. He is really good, and I know he would help you. Oh, get back up here so I can go to the next slide. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about my DNA, and you would hope that my DNA uh, would be similar, whether it's from my heritage or 23andMe or Ancestry or any of the other DNA testing machines. And this is the one from my heritage. Remember that uh, we believe that my grandparents on my mother's side were German. They came from Germany. That is true. I have found that. I have found a port that they left Germany from, and I have found where they lived in Germany. But my heritage says that I am 76.3% Scandinavian. All right, 12% Eastern European, 11% North and West European. That doesn't necessarily agree with what I believed before, does it? That we were half German. Okay, what about the next one? Ancestry.com. Uh, Norway, you see up at top, and it's blocked out by the picture of me and there. Uh, okay. Uh, you can see up there, Norway is 50%. Uh, Eastern European Russia, 23%. Oh, Sweden, 20%. That's the first time I've run into uh, a section of DNA testing that came back with Sweden information. Okay, right. let's go on to the next one and see what they say. 
23 and me. Ancestry composition. Yes, Lester is my full first name. Uh, European, all European, 100%, which is not un, under unusual. Uh, Scandinavian, 72.3. Eastern European, 27.7. And again, you know, three quarters of it is from Norway. One quarter or even less is from Germany area. Now, remember that um, in Europe, Germany, Poland, et cetera, changed hands just like uh, France and other countries did, depending on who was most powerful in the area and who invaded somebody else's land and that kind of stuff. But when I saw the uh, Stockholm, Sweden, in this one as well, uh, made me do a little bit of research. And back uh, in the 1700s, the King of Sweden invaded which is now, what is now Poland and Germany, and he ruled it for 150 or so years. He brought his tradesmen, he brought his army, he brought other people from um, Sweden to help him uh, govern the area of, uh, of Germany, Poland, where he ruled. And I'm guessing, there's only a guess on my part, that my ancestors came from some of the people, probably the men, probably in the military, probably single, who found German women enticing, shall we say. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna leave that as it is. I want you to share your your findings. So I want you to share it and publish it. Uh, share your tree if it's online. Just the, the nice thing to do to help other people uh, who are searching maybe in your area and so forth. And if you find a story of someone who was in the same area, the same town, the same uh, uh, locale as one of your ancestors and he or she has stories about it, uh, perhaps those stories would be helpful in your history. You can go out and create a, uh, a, a website of your own. And I created one called BakiHistory.com. You're certainly welcome to go out there and look at it. It's, it's shared with everybody and, and you can see that. And uh, if you're so inclined, write a book. Now, do you have any resources locally? In addition to the library that you're connecting to or sitting in right now, which is a wonderful library, and we love all the people that are there, uh, there is a Red River Valley Genealogical Society. It's located at Bonanzaville over in West Fargo. There is their website. Uh, some really helpful people over there. They're only open a couple days a week, and you can check their website to make sure you know when or give a call and schedule a time. And uh, you can tell them Les sent you. That's fine. I know the people over there. The Sons of Norway is something brand new. And uh, they're in the process of creating a little, mostly or almost all Norwegian genealogical research in their library that is going online. You can see the Sons of Norway, Fargo.com is the website for it. Uh, but they're all they're also digitizing uh, no they're entering their books very similar to the library you're connected with right now and you can go out and do a search for books they're putting more books in every day and as if you go to the Laurel library you will see a scroll of I think it's new books or new uh, acquisitions that you can check out they're doing the same thing with the one in uh, Sons of Norway, where you see the books that have recently been scanned in. Every fall, uh, the uh, Heritage Education Commission in, uh, in the Red River Valley area has a workshop, a one-day workshop, and they have all sorts of classes on various uh, parts of, uh, of genealogical research. This is a shot of the webpage advertising the 2021 um, 
workshop that was held all, uh, completely online this year. And it, uh, it hopes to be back in person next year, as far as I know. I still have friends on that group. Now, in closing for the uh, actual presentation, and I said this was about 45 to 50 minutes long, I'm pretty close, you'll see that little cartoon. Great Uncle Bertram didn't have a computer in 1880, so how will you find him online? Well, we all know that he wasn't online. It's just like the internet quotes that have been um, associated with Abraham Lincoln. That's not true either. Uh, that is uh, what we are. Now, that is the last slide of my presentation. I'm going to, I think it's the last slide, it should be. Oh, no, not quite. Uh, I hesitated to put this out there because, you know, advertising your Gmail account and all of a sudden everybody wants me to help them do family research on, on person A, person B, etc. I do not, I do not, I do not do this as a volunteer or for hire, neither. I will not uh, become your researcher. There are lots of places out there where you can hire a researcher. There are some places that you get volunteers to help you do that. Now, I'm open to questions. It's back to you, my friend. All right. So Jill had a question in the chat. Uh, how do you research someone's military record? We have an ancestor who died during perhaps the Spanish-American War and was buried not in the U.S. Um, not in the, was he in the U.S. military at the time? Is, the, is question number one. If, if the person was in the U.S. military at the time, then uh, about the only place I know that might have the record is the uh, repository in uh, St. Louis. And that was on the slide. Um, would you like me to give you a PDF of all the slides? Yeah, that's actually a question that someone had. Um, can we get copies of the slides emailed to us for reference? So yeah. if you want to get that to me, then I can. You can have it. Next yeah, time you absolutely. Get it. Yeah. Uh, what I may do is edit out some of the, uh, the personal family stories and sure. just give you the research things that'll cut it down from 45 slides to probably 10, okay. but the important ones, you know, would be the uh, military records, Ellis Island, Castle Garden, uh, LDS Church, uh, Ancestry, and those kinds of things, the real research that's available and useful to most anyone. But that's the only military repository that I know of. Jill had a follow-up question, and that is, how do you research smaller or close-knit groups? We may have Sami ancestors in Sweden. Also, is there a specific search for Jewish heritage, German records? How much was destroyed during World War II? That was one question, huh? Nope. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I, know, I know Norway better than I know Sweden. I know neither country has been invaded like mainland Europe was by various other places that destroyed a lot of, uh, of record buildings. So I know Norway kept excellent, excellent records and they're all preserved. I believe Sweden does the same thing. There is a website and I probably should have included it knowing the uh, ethnic background of many of the people up there. Um, uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but there is a, uh, a site in Norway where you can research the Norwegian records in either Norwegian or English, which is really nice. The internet is pretty good about that. Uh, Sweden, I'm guessing they do. I don't know. Um, World War II records. Uh, and again, those are mostly military records that you can get factual information and again to the uh, um, to the site in St. Louis for that. Jewish records. Uh, Jewish records, I, I can get you that information because uh, I, I do volunteer work all over the place. 
And one of the places down here is that I, I volunteer with my technological talents and whatever they are with uh, the Jewish temple in town. And I know a woman there who does Jewish research, strictly Jewish research. And I'll, I'll get you that information. It'll take a little while, but uh, I'll get you that information. What else was in the question that I missed? Uh, well, she said thank you. So I think, did we answer your question completely, Jill? Sammy. Okay. I may oh, be saying Sammy. that wrong. Sammy. Uh, Sami are the people of uh, the northern part of uh, Sweden, Norway, uh, uh, Finland area up there. Um, I know somebody that does Sami research. Oh, who is it? Um, ask, ask the um, Red River Genealogical Society, Red River Valley Genealogical Society, and I think they may be able to connect you to somebody that does Sami research. Uh, who else? Oh, uh, uh, the Historical Society of Clay County in the Yumcombe Center. Uh, I'm going to give you her name. Contact Maureen Zimmer, uh, Maureen uh, Kelly Jonathan over there. And I know she can direct you to someone who uh, does Sami research because they have the Viking village and frequently they have the Sami uh, uh, people there and they set up a little camp and behind the Yumcombe Center and so forth. She'd be another good research to ask for who to contact. She won't do the research, of course, but cool. Good questions. You're on mute again, my friend. I've got two more questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we've got um, a question here. So where are there English translations over Norwegian records? Is there a website that you recommend? Well, as I said, there is this one site and, and I should have included it and I apologize for not. I'll find the information and send it to you. But it you can tell it when you log into the site, when you go to the site, whether you want to do it in Norwegian or if you want to do it in English. And it, it, that's all you have to do. Now, if you find uh, typed Norwegian records in Norwegian, you can copy it, go to Google Translate, paste it in there, and it does a reasonably good job of translating English. Uh, better than nothing is what I tell people, unless you have somebody that reads Old Norsk versus New Norsk. All right, we've got another question in the chat from Noel. How are 23andMe and Ancestry.com the same and how are they different? Do you have any insight? Oh, sure. Uh, they're very much the same. They, they collect records. They have uh, different uh, participants, you know. Uh, people have different family trees on the two of them. Uh, as I said, uh, my heritage, last time I checked, has the largest number of records, Ancestry a second. They're the big two for family research. Um, the LDS Church is number three, but those are those two are the big two. Um, I, I search on both of them, and I have found things on particular branches of my family on one that are not on the other one. And it's because their members uh, are, are different. Uh, is one any better than the other one? I don't think so. I think they're both very good. But um, Ancestry has the big clout in the United States because they advertise all over the place. They have TV shows and everything about how you can find amazing things of your ancestor back during a revolutionary war. But I, I recommend both of them. And I recommend the LDS Church if you don't want to spend money. It's a good way to start. The other thing, and I forgot to mention this too, so I might as well tell you now. If you put your family tree on one of those, you can export it from there into a standard database format and then import it into the other one. And I've done that, and it does work. It's called GEDCOM, G-E-D-C-O-M. 
It's the common interface for genealogical research. Beautiful. Well, I don't have any more uh, questions in the chat um, or here. I just wanted to, before we go, mention some of the resources we have at the library. I knew you yes, would do that, so I let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have on laurel.org um, under the research tab, it tells you there is a genealogy tab and you have access to use Ancestry, Ancestry I'm having some feedback, in the library. Um, you can use Heritage Quest inside or outside the library. We've got Heritage Quest, ProQuest. So yeah, if we have a microfilm reader um, with records from, um, let's see here, we've got the Fargo Forum, the Detroit Lakes Tribune, um, Norman County Index, Crookston Times, so we have quite a few things here for you to get started. And if you go back, uh, if you go to some counties, they may have a bunch of their own county records online as well. Uh, Polk County many years ago, several years ago, I was out there poking around and I found a, a complete copy of their centennial book for Polk County. You know, like 200 pages long. So I said, what the heck? And I downloaded it. You get lucky once in a while. Every now and then. <laughs> yeah. And one more, one more story I can tell. Uh, this happened this summer. Uh, with uh, DNA testing, uh, we got an email message from Ancestry uh, because my sweetie Bev took uh, as an account there. Anyhow, this guy in San Diego, California said, I believe you and I are third cousins. So Bev went and looked in her database and said, well, the family is there. He wasn't there, but her family was there. So we did a couple Zoom calls with him and everything else, and he seemed to be a reasonably nice guy and everything else. Then one day I got an email from him saying that his company, a company that buys other companies, had just purchased a company in Fargo, North Dakota, and he thought that was pretty close to Moorhead. And I said, yeah, and not only the company that you bought, I have known one of the two founders since he was a tiny little kid. His father and I were classmates in college. You know, what do you want to know about him? And anyhow, you know, this man became the uh, liaison between the parent company and the company they purchased. So he's been in Fargo. We've had dinner together and all sorts of stuff. Had lunch one day at Sons of Norway even. So you get interesting things. And the other thing that happened to, he told us this, you don't mind if I throw another little story out. Stories are good, they're interesting, okay? The, uh, he said uh, about a year and a half ago, he got a phone call from some young man who had found, had done his DNA testing with Ancestry and said, I believe you're my father. Okay, yeah. So he said, oh, really? Yes, he said, uh, this woman, and he named her, uh, was my mother, according to DNA testing and from adoption research. He would, had been given up for adoption and she believed that this third cousin was the father. And he said, well, yeah, I did date her for a while and yeah, we had fun together and and uh, then we broke up and she never told him anything. Now, the wonderful part of the story is the father has brought this young man into his family. Um, he gained a couple grandchildren out of the deal and, and they become really good friends. So it could have gone either way. It went the positive way. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice story. I love it. Well, I think that we're good here in the library. No more questions. We're good to go. Okay, so we will see you then soon on January 19th. Oh, from that's right. January 19th and February 16th are in the next two sessions. And we'll be working on family search. Yes. Perfect. All right. Okay. Well, thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Enjoy the uh, 
You got a snowstorm coming, I heard? Yes, that's what we hear. Okay, good for you. We don't. <laughs> All right, good night. We're in Liz. southern Arizona. I don't know if anybody told you that, but we're in southern Arizona right now. Have fun. I know. You I know. know. I know you know. <laughs> okay, take Have care. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you yep. for coming.